Hey, welcome back. Thanks for joining the channel. Good to see you again. And uh, yeah, let's continue on this Pioneer uh, QX747. So I know it doesn't look like much right now, but um, in the previous two videos, we went through and we did a lot of work on this thing. Um, pretty much everything that needs to be done has been done. Uh, so this video here, I plan on turning off my soldering iron and just focusing on uh, doing the adjustments. I do have all the printout of the factory manual, the alignment procedures for the AM, FM. We're going to go through and test those, make sure that everything's working 100%. I did have the dial cord apart, so I think I have a, I might have an issue with uh, maybe the uh, dial alignment, uh, the, the uh, tracking of the pointer. And then we're going to go through, uh, well, we still have to do the power amplifier adjustments. We haven't finished that. We Last time we left off, we just did a test, a simple, quick and dirty test, just to confirm that all our power amplifiers are working and they're working good, and they are. And then we're going to go through a CD4 demodulator alignment. We're going to try this out. And, uh, and then at the end of this video, I hope to do a, a test of a CD4 um, vinyl disc I have purchased on eBay it's a test disc it's not any music it's just for it's a test disc for aligning and setting up your four channel decoder so that you can listen to your four channel music that's all the disc is its purpose is is just to set it up so we're gonna try that out too and see how it works and we're gonna see how four channel sounds I know it won't come across in the camera but I can maybe give you my take on it but uh, yeah we have a lot more to do here we got cleaning to do clean the front panel yet and uh, I did put the knobs in the ultrasonic cleaner so they came back they came back looking pretty good they got a nice sparkle to them I don't know if you can see that the importance of putting it in the ultrasonic is you get all the grit and dirt and junk out of these grooves and uh, because you know if you leave that in there you can see that stuff and it looks just grody but um, yeah, these knobs turned out okay. They might need a little bit more polishing on some of the surfaces, but this one, for example, didn't come back the greatest. I might have to go through and give it another scrub. So I got that, I put the front panel on and then we can get on with some adjustments. So let's get at it. So I'm just onto my assembly now and I'm just doing some cleaning. And I want you to look at the filth on this thing. I don't know if you can see that if it's coming across, but this is nasty, nasty, nasty. And I just, for face plates, I just use a foaming glass cleaner and uh, just give it a good soaking. Just let it sit for a while and, and you'll start to see the, the brown liquid coming off. I don't know if you can see that brown liquid. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Anyways, let's swipe with a nasty business. So I'll do this with my dirty rag <laughs> and then I'll switch to a clean rag and do it a couple more times. And I got to make sure that I get all of the, uh, the face plate is perfectly cleaned. It's uh, to me, that's important. You got to have a clean face plate to have a clean looking receiver. If it's got fingerprints and smudges and nicotine stains and everything else, it uh, really detracts from the from the from the look of it. Yeah, it's pretty gross. So it's already looking 100% better. I still have to do the inside of the glass. The glass is kind of it's all fogged up with the smoke staining. So I'll do that, but I'm going to throw this rag away and then do it again with another clean rag. This time I don't have to go so hard with the, with the cleaner. And you can see it's still picking up. I'll do this a couple more times. Yeah, you can see it's still picking up. 
all kinds of nastiness and it's coming out a lot cleaner and then what i'll do is i'll uh, for all these push buttons they need to be cleaned as well so i'll get a cotton swab and go in and clean these i'll soak this with the same cleaner and i'll go in and I'll clean all these little holes because the buttons will stick if there's anything that was syrupy or uh, uh let's do that right now anything that's been syrupy or uh, you know spilt on it so let's go in and give it a Each one of these are clean. And you already see it's coming out dirty. Yeah, it's filthy now. Yeah. Okay, I just want to show you what I was up against. So I'm going to reassemble this and then we'll move on to some testing. Hey, I got the front back together and it's starting to look good. Um, looking a lot better than what it was. Let me show you what the lighting looks like. Let me just turn it on. I don't know if this is going to show up good in the camera or not, but it, uh, yeah, it's looking pretty good. Where's the volume? Do I have any FM here? I think I have. No stereo because I got no antenna. But. Yeah, it's looking a lot better. And best of all, it doesn't stink anymore, not like it used to. It's, uh, it's quite a bit cleaner. So let's uh, start with a few things here. Um, Let's do the power amplifier alignment first. Get set up for this. Uh, so what they want is no load on the speaker terminals. Terminal terminate the input terminals of power amplifier assembly with a 5.1k ohm resistor. This doesn't have jumpers. So they want me to hunt down the inputs and put 5.1 K ohm resistors on there. Set up the power boosting switch to four channel position, then energize the unit. For the first approximately six seconds, relay remains open, keeping the unit muted. So I think, I don't think it's six seconds. I think it's more like three. Maybe four or five seconds, but that's okay. Confirm that all voltages as indicated in the circuit diagram on page 71. Well, we know we have a working amplifier. We tested it last, last video. If voltages are greatly different from the rated value, shut off power immediately. Check the suspicious, suspicious, suspicious areas, especially the power supply circuit assembly. Those suspicious power supplies. Yeah. If the relay remains open immediately after the power amplifier has been come into operation, a defect in the output transistors can be suspected. Check the output stage. After approximately 10 to 20 minutes of warming up, adjust VR101 so that the voltage across terminals 96, 97 on the power amplifier becomes 20 millivolts. Okay, I guess that's our uh, bias setting. In the same way, adjust the following variable resistors to obtain 20 millivolts. Okay, so they give you the resistor for each channel. Next, connect the voltmeter between terminal 60 and ground. Adjust VR1 to obtain zero volts reading. Okay, that's to be the DC offset on the output. Okay, after that, you uh, return everything back to normal and put the plates on. But let's go through this. We've got four adjustments for the bias, four adjustments for the zeroing. So let's do that now. So if you have a look at this diagram, this shows the driver board for the power amplifier. These down here are all the power transistors on the heatsink and all the wiring is going to it. And they are asking for 96, 97. So here's 96, 97 test points. 94, 95, 92, 93, 90, 91. And these are on the top here. This is actually mounted like this, upside down. So uh, 96, 97 should be, well, it's channel one, I believe. Does this say channel one here? Doesn't tell me. Channel one, channel two, okay. And it says here on the board, channel one. 
so I can see channel 1 and 96, 97. And hook up our leads. I have this thing sitting on for a while, so let's just connect up our leads and see what we're supposed to get 20 millivolts. And where are we at? We're at 13. So they say 10 to 20 minutes. It's only been on for about four or five. So I'm just going to let this idle for a bit and I'm just going to see how this goes up or down. All right, so we've been idling here for about half an hour and uh, it went up to about 15 millivolts. It's been hovering up and down. So let's adjust this. We want 20. Let's turn this one up. and this heat sink is sitting at room temperature it's not warm at all barely all right so let's do this next channel this is channel two and we are low on that one as well so let's turn this one up to 20 Next, next channel. Channel three, which is the, one of the front channels. Turn this one down a little bit. Okay, and then the last one. quite low. Let's turn this one up. Okay, there we go. In case you're wondering the negative, you just ignore that. Uh, all we're doing is we're measuring a voltage across the resistor to determine how much current's flowing through it. And uh, 20 milliamps across, I don't know what, is, what these resistors are. They're half ohm resistors, so that would be like, do the math, it's something like 10 milliamps or something like that. Or maybe it's more, I can't remember. But I'm going to let this sit for a little bit and then I'll come back and check them one more time, make sure they're all staying stable because these will float up and down a bit. Uh, turn most of them up so that I expect my heat sink will start warming up a little bit more but uh, I'll recheck this and make sure it's good. All right so for the next adjustment we're going to do the uh, zero, zeroing out of the, uh, the power amplifiers. There's four of them. We're going to connect our voltmeter between ground and there's a star ground here right beside the protection board. That's all star ground and the there's four pins. Pin 60, 52, 43, and 35. And those uh, four pins are the output pins from the amplifier. Those are the speaker outputs. And it's before any switching or any relays or anything. That's the uh, what's coming out of the amplifier. So we're gonna find pin 60, and that's right up here, this yellow one. And connect our meter up here, and we should have zero volts. We don't. We have I don't know what the tolerance is, but we're going to adjust this one. There is a pot down. I'm doing the top one. Yeah, the top one. The pot's on the other side, so you got to... So let's adjust this down to zero. It's a little bit jumpy. I'm just going to go back and forth and tweak the... Pretty close there. I got one millivolt. Minus one millivolt. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Next one's pin 52. You get a flashlight, you can get in here and see. Pin 52 is right here. This yellow, or the white wire, sorry. The last one was yellow. This one's white. 
and we got minus two millivolts which is pretty darn close i don't think i can tweak it any better than that where is it here What's going on? It's not moving. I got the wrong pot, that's why. I'm tweaking the wrong pot. Okay. Try and get it closer to zero. Right about there, I think. <coughs> Next one is pin 43 which should be in 43 is this green wire here this one should be way out now because I crank in the pot from the other side okay is at 56 let's turn it down <clears throat> Six. It's not the best to use a digital meter for this. Fifteen. You got to move it a little bit and then let it settle. Twelve. Three. A little more. Right there, I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay, last one is pin 35. And pin 35 is right at the bottom here, this orange wire. And we got minus two, which is very, very close. Let's see if we can get it a little better. No, it's very touchy. Point nine. Yeah, less than one. We're good. All right. So the AM band. I'm gonna do a little bit of tune up on the AM band. Uh, it's working. Let's see here. Let's get this. Set everything to zero here. CD four AM. Turn up the volume. I don't know what station that is. It's distant. Picking up. Uh, There's a series. I'm, I'm wondering what they're going to be able to do. I just still think that's a local station. It's pretty good. That's the it's pretty good at rejecting the um, interference and picking up those distant stations. It's a really good, really good AM tuner. Darkness that we live in. I don't know what that is all about. 30. 30. Might, might be AM stereo. I don't know. January contract. Anyhow, I, I'm learning. So uh, if you are on hold and there are no Yes. Okay. Gives Alberta. All right. So we'll set it to 600. Right on 600. And I'll turn on my signal generator. It's set to for 600 as well. So let's go turn up the volume on that. I got it hooked up to a, a loop wire coil. Well, I gotta turn on, on modulation. Okay. 
Here's my 400 hertz. I'd say that's pretty bang on. I'm not going to get any better than that. It's off a little bit. Maybe 50 kilohertz or so off, but I don't think it's that bad. Let's try 1400. a little bit off on that one too. Let's do 600 first. We'll set this so it's bang on and then we'll uh, continue on with FM. So 600. So it's just slightly off channel. So I'm going to tweak the oscillator. You can hear as I go off channel, you get a little bit of a hiss. And that's center channel right there, but it's off a bit on here. So I'm going to turn it and we're going to adjust it. Just to get that peak. Turn down the amplitude. I'm just going to adjust for a peak. Right there. Now, what we got to do is we have to adjust the bar antenna for maximum peaking. So, we'll pull that bar antenna out. Going down, go the other way. Okay, so that was peaked. So we're good there. Now we're gonna do the top end of the band, going back up to 1400 kilohertz. Okay, 1400, let's go up here. Center this pointer on 1400. Turn up the volume a little bit and turn on our signal. Okay, so what we want to do is adjust trimmer capacitor 5 and 6 on a tuner assembly for peak output. And 5 and 6. I know this doesn't show you, but it's right on top here. Maybe I'll get the camera a little better positioned. So if you look at the diagram compared to the board, here's five, here's six. So this would be five, this is six. Four, six, three, five, two, one. Okay, let me get a little uh, better screwdriver for this. He's been painted, so I don't know how they're going to... Oh, I'm doing the wrong one already. This one's six. Right there. So what I want to do is I want to peak this, so I'm going to turn down the signal.
want your maximum signal and least amount of background noise. Right there. And number five. Same thing, peek it out. So I'll turn it down a little more. Right there. Now you can use the signal meter as your tuning guide as a relative for signal strength. That works. Um, what they tell you to do in the manual is they tell you to hook up equipment to the uh, output jacks of the tape monitor and uh, measure that signal there. But I think your ears are pretty good at, especially when you have a steady tone from a signal generator, you can tell when the tone is louder or quieter. So that's it for AM. It's all done. Was able to realize her. I'm careless. Those things come at the bottom. What I'm concerned about is the spiritual battle, is the warfare, and are the believers winning the battle? All right, so on to the FM. Let's just have a little scan through the band, see how it sounds. Uh, I got the muting on, I hooked a little piece of wire up for an antenna, let's see how it does. It's sponsored by... Technically the most... It does sound 100% better now that I recapped that power supply. I think the distortion I was hearing in the beginning when I first tried this receiver out was it had really bad power. In for the tuner and I, that's the reason why I was getting all the distortion. It just sounded horrible, but now it's sounding pretty good. Zap for more details. This November. Seems, seems like it's picking up all our stations. And we don't have a proper antenna on it, so it's working pretty good. Uh, we've been giving out Bailey shots for years. Yeah, it's working good. What I'll do is I'll just check, check the dial accuracy. I'll set up my signal generator and I'll set it for, um, let's see here. Yes. 94 megahertz is nothing. Okay, so I'll set it for 94 megahertz. We'll see how close we are. Quite a strong signal. Yeah, we are a little bit out on the dial too. Not much. So let's um, let's go to 88 megahertz. We'll set this up. 88 megahertz, and we'll set it up so that the tuning is correct. Oh, it's not bad. It's pretty close. Uh, 
It's actually right on, on 88 megahertz. Let's try 108. 107. Set for 107. And there it is. So yeah, I'm gonna leave that alone. I think the FM is working perfect. I'm not gonna mess with it at all. I think it's good. So we're gonna leave that and we'll move on to the CD4 adjustments. Okay, so I remember when I said I, we had a hum on the phono stage listen to this i got it turned up uh probably to the second notch and it's quite loud when i touch it it goes down quite a bit and then when i put the cover on completely gone so yeah completely gone with the cover on it's not a very good design like I don't think I've ever done a receiver that had such bad hum with the cover off and these wires here just how sensitive these amplifiers are. This, these wires are microphonic. If I touch them, they make noise. If I rub them, green wire for the right channel. So we have to work around that somehow. Now that we have um, our power amplifier tuned in and our tuner uh, checked and it's adequate I'm not going to make any adjustments there we're going to focus our attention now on the CD4 demodulator and the adjustments required for that now I'm going to admit right here right now this is out of my realm of any kind of knowledge I don't even know how this works so I think for the benefit of myself and everybody I'm just going to go through and I'm going to read the circuit descriptions that Pioneer provided in the service manual and it give us an idea how this how this system works and uh, I think that would benefit us. So let's go through um, what they've written. So the first up is the equalizer stage. This is the phono input stage of the receiver. It has two amplifiers. Um, let's read this here. The equalizer amplifier comprises five transistors in each channel. Three of these operate as negative feedback type equalizer amplifier to obtain the standard RIAA equalization characteristics. Okay, so yeah, you can see three transistors here, three transistors here. We've got our, our uh, precision styrene capacitors. We've got, so basically this is our uh, amplifier section here and here. And then the second half here, the other two form a buffer amplifier which supplies the CD4 subcarrier signal to the subchannel assembly. After phono equalization, the signal passes through a low-pass filter and thence to the matrix assembly. The purpose of this low-pass filter is to prevent any leakage of the supersonic subcarrier signal of the CD4 disk onto the main signal path. So we have input and buffer, in, input equalization and amplification, and then we have two buffer transistors here. We have this big block in the middle, and this is our low-pass filter for both channels. And I believe, I don't know what the cutoff is for this, probably 20 kilohertz or 22 kilohertz, something like that. And then it's got a couple of amplifiers here to provide uh, for the next circuit. The next section is the subchannel, the DC4 demodulator. And that's this board here, this big one in the middle. This is our subchannel, it's got a phase lock loop on it and uh, decoder. The subchannel carrier from the CD4 record first passes through the carrier le level control, which is this button here. I didn't know this mystery pot that was on the bottom of the receiver. And uh, it's adjustable. This uh, subcarrier is a 30 kilohertz signal frequency modulated with a front minus rear difference information, okay? 
demodulation takes place in a phase lock loop circuit, which is made up with these three integrated circuits here. Uh, the resulting audio signal then passes through the ASC, which is the automatic sensitivity control, and uh, the subcarrier, or sorry, the sub equalizer and muting circuits, and then through the ANRS, which is the automatic noise reduction system circuit to the matrix circuit. So this card here, this board, does a lot of different things. It's got uh, muting on it, it's got the phase lock loop, um, automatic level controls, and a lot of things happen here. So next in the path is the matrix circuit, which is this top board here. Uh, the main CD4 signal from the equalizer and the sub signal from the sub channel assembly are added and subtracted in a series of algebraic operations to obtain four independent channel signals. This is done in the matrix circuit. So it's all done right here. And this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight transistors. Uh, you know, it's a pretty basic circuit. Different phono cartridges produce different output voltages and therefore main signals of different levels. Uh, the sub signal, however, being FM modulated does not vary in level after demodulation, of course. To obtain the optimum channel separation in the matrix operation, the main and sub signals must therefore be matched in level. This is done by the separation control on the front panel, these two knobs here which regulates the main signal level. It controls the amount of negative feedback at the transistor's emitter. Okay, so these will have an important role in setting up the four channel. RM and SQ decoder circuits, the regular matrix. The regular matrix, this decoder board, is sitting underneath the uh, matrix circuit board. So this is the one underneath here. And it comprises of, looks like, two, three, four, five, Six, seven. Oh, it's got a few channels there. It's got four channels. A lot going on in this board too. The signal from the equalizers enters the decoder assembly if the mode switch is at RM or SQ position, which is on the front here. The decoder comprises of two phase shifters and a matrix circuit. By changing the positions of the mode switch, the decoder can be made to operate according to the RM or SQ system. So after all that, the next step is the control amplifier, which I believe is what they're talking about is these two tone amplifier boards on the, on the amplifier here. The control amplifier is a negative feedback circuit comprising of three transistors. To obtain stable operation, this two-stage direct coupled circuit constitutes a buffer amplifier of high imp in input impedance, uh, but low output impedance, okay? So I think that's what's going on here. This is the final stage before the power amplifier. Power amplifier and protection circuits. The power amplifier is basically an all-stage direct couple, coupled pure complementary design. Power supply, of course, is the balanced positive negative type. So that's all this block up here. With the mode switch in the two channel position, the rear channel inputs are grounded, only the front channel inputs remain operative. So like I said before, when you switch this to two channel, uh, the two rear amplifiers go silent and uh, there's nothing going through them. The protection circuit incorporates four transistors, which is one for each channel, for four channels which uh, are used to detect overload. And that's this circuit down here. DC potential at the junction points of the output stage transistors is done by a differential amplifier consisting of two transistors. Additionally, three transistors are used to drive the cutoff relay. At the first sign of trouble, the relay contacts are open to safeguard the output transistors and the speakers. The protector circuit also serves as a muting circuit, keeping the unit silent during the first few seconds of uh, power on. So this is uh, pretty, pretty vanilla here. This is just sets up, it senses the power transistors, any weird offset and voltage. Um, and I did demonstrate that this works with a short circuit as well. And I had a short on one of my speakers. I had it connected to my what I thought was my voltmeter, but actually I had it shunted as an ammeter. So the speaker was shunted and it, I couldn't turn the volume knob past uh, one before it would click off. Very low power output. It would sense it and kill the, uh, the relay. 
When the power boosting switch on the rear panel is set to two channel, the output stages will operate in two channel mode, regardless of the position of the mode switch. At the same time, power supply is switched to the other taps on the power transformer, supplying a higher voltage to the power amplifiers. As a result, available output power per channel in two channel operation is approximately twice that of the four channel operation. An indicator is provided for each channel. The length of the bright line varies in accordance to the output level of each channel, giving a kind of display effect. Its operating principle is as follows. A shutter is moved in accordance with the current flowing through a moving coil. This current is obtained from the power amplifiers. Output from the power amplifier is divided and one portion is rectified. The resulting DC current flows through the indicator coil moving the shutter. The above mentioned voltage division is affected by indicator level switches, which is these two switches here. You can increase the sensitivity by turning these two switches on. To protect the indicator coil against possible overload, a diode is shunted in the circuit operating as a limiter. So that's how that works. So now that we know basically how this works, it works on a subcarrier, uh, 30 kilohertz subcarrier, and uh, it's FM modulated, and we have a phase lock loop here that does the demodulation. Let's look at some of the adjustments for this circuit. Um, I don't think there's really much to say on this. There is a little bit of a write-up here on uh, what to do. It gives a, a brief um, outline of, of alignment. And I'll, I'll show you what it says here. Uh, when the phase lock loop demodulator integrated circuit has been replaced, which is one of these three integrated circuits, adjustments should be made in the following order. Uh, note, this method is both convenient and simple, but if carried out carefully, is capable of adjustment over a practical range. However, that unless the test record PQX1011 and the phono cartridge used for the audition are both new, the adjustment is impossible. Now, I don't have a Pioneer uh, alignment album or test record. Um, you go on eBay and look for the Pioneer alignment test records and they're pretty pricey. But I did find the JVC one and this is a CD4 disc. It uses the same system. Um, it was quite a bit cheaper and uh, so I purchased this one and we're going to use this for testing today on this on this quad receiver. But what I've done is I fed in a 30 kilohertz test tone into the phono jack and I'll tell you exactly what, what went on with that, but we'll get into that here in a bit. I just want to read through this alignment procedure. So terminal 19 of the sub-channel assembly must be set to ground. Terminal 19 is right here, and if I ground it, what that does is it unmutes the uh, sub-channel demodulator. Connecting the oscilloscope to terminal 14, the left channel, and for the right channel, use five. So I got a scope hooked up to 14 and five here. Turn the carrier level control up to its maximum level, fully clockwise. So I turn this right up. And then it wants me to play uh, track one of the test record. First, it would be band one is the left channel, band two for the right channel. And the warble, warble tone should be displayed on my oscilloscope. They don't have any pictorial here of what it's supposed to look like. Turn the carrier level control to the left until the position where the warble tone waveform distorts is reached. This is the adjustment is extremely critical and should be performed with great care. So I just turn this down counterclockwise until I get distortion on my scope. Uh, adjust VR10 until the warble tone distortion appear, disappears. For the right channel you use VR1. So where are our adjustment points? VR1, VR10, these are these top two pots here. One thing about Pioneer is they don't mark their boards with part numbers. You have to refer to the service manual for uh, part locations. It's kind of annoying. You have to have the book out and open in front of you when you're doing servicing. It is preferable for the adjustment to be made with the lowest possible carry level so the oscilloscope you should have a high vertical sensitivity as possible, approximately 10 millivolts per centimeter. So let's go through this and try this. But I'm, instead of using the test record, I'm going to use a test tone fed from my signal generator. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up for 30 kilohertz. And I'm going to set the amplitude down to the minimum, which is one millivolt. Actually, no, the minimum I have right here is 100 microvolts. So that's what we're going to feed in. We're going to feed in a 100 microvolt signal into the phono. And we're going to feed um, 30 kilohertz tone. And we're going to see what how this behaves. And I'll set up the scope so that we can see what, what the signal looks like. Typically, phono magnetic phono cartridges output magnitude of one to two millivolts uh, average for, for programming. So we can use that as a guide as to what kind of signal is set into this thing. I'm going to try it with the weakest signal possible that my signal generator will do, and it looks like it's going to be 100 microvolts. All right, so I got everything wired in. Uh, let's turn this thing on. And we got our horrible hum, which will go away once we put our bottom cover on. You hear kind of a whistle in the... Uh, let me turn this to two channel. We're picking up a whistle of some kind. Turn this to CD4, and let's turn on the signal generator. And I don't know if you can see that, but this pilot light come on, telling us we're in CD4 mode. And I can hear a bit of a whistle. Sounds like it's doing something. And my scope is showing the signal. Let's turn this off again. It goes away, comes on, locks in. Doesn't look like it's very uh, even in amplitude. Let's turn this down. This carrier level control, let's turn this down until we get distortion. We got quieter there. And then we lost our signal. We turned it down too much. So there is a point where we're getting a distortion here. When I back it off, it quiets down. So let's try turning up the amplitude of this signal. to one millivolt. Let's try this again. Maximum. A bit of a scratchy pot there. And then we lose it. So I guess Doing this with a signal generator is kind of pointless because we don't know the proper signal levels, but it, it, it is appearing to be working. As we can see, the, the CD4 light has come on, the pilot signal light, and uh, everything's working according to plan, I guess. Okay, well, I think the next step here is to get a test record going queued up and we'll feed that in and see what we can do with uh, with that. Okay so I was just playing around with the muting here and the muting's functioning as designed or intended. Um, if I adjust the carrier level we can see that it will lock in. If I turn it up, if I turn it down one notch it drops out. Now if I unmute it manually by grounding this pin 19 it shows it as 
unmuted and I can adjust this down we start getting an oscillation in this circuit turn it up a little bit a little bit more and if I give it one more click that's when the phase lock loop kicks in and locks in but it doesn't show it because it's already unlocked if I do this take this out and turn it down one it drops out and we don't hear that oscillation so everything here is working good I expect if I turn this down to a point where I have least amount of background noise I think that is the correct setting if I turn these up you can hear that whistle I think that's an artifact of the demodulator itself and at this volume level I don't think you would hear that in the program source because I got it cranked about half volume here and typically in operation these knobs would be set halfway to get a front rear balance and I don't think that whistle noise would be uh, disturbing at all okay so let's get a an album queued up here see if I can make space for a turntable all right bad news I thought I could just hook up one of my old turntables and we could get this thing underway but my Techniques SL7 is uh, completely in need of a repair it um, let's put it this way is it's not fit for playing records so I brought this one out this one is a Harman Kardon I think it's an ST7 I think and I bought this one on eBay about two years ago with the uh, understanding that it works great oh yeah everything's good but when it came uh, unfortunately the dust cover was smashed um, and I recently replaced well found a replacement dust cover and uh, but I've never actually never tried this turntable out before so I don't even know how it works like this is broken this window is broken um, I guess these are speed pots here and I was like how do we turn this thing on and actually I found a little switch under here and yeah I can see it it's on the queuing action works so slow I think it's probably just gummed up grease viscous grease and I don't think I think there's pieces missing here I'm not sure anyways this video isn't about this turntable this video is about the Pioneer Quadraphonic and I'm trying to get this thing going so let's see if we can queue up a record here I got it all connected This thing's 45, so let's press this one. I think this is... Oh, that doesn't look too promising. I don't even think it's spinning at the right speed. Oh, yeah, another thing. Um, the cartridge has no stylus. The, the old stylus is broken off. Probably some ham-fisted kid got in here was playing around with it. So what is it doing? It did something. Uh, I don't know so I think I'm gonna change this cartridge out yeah it looks like things are bent here it just doesn't seem to be natural I'm just gonna be repair video on itself but I just wanted to see if it would get it to work enough oh now it's stopping okay let me change that cartridge I have myself I'm lucky enough to acquisition a brand new record box cartridge yes believe it or not this is brand new and this is from China I paid 15 bucks for it and I bought it out of a whim just to say well what the hell let's try one of these cartridges out that China sells so we'll get this thing mounted up and put in and then set up and then we'll see if we can get this test record to work that's my plan I don't want to turn this into a turntable repair video but uh, we've got we to gotta do something. If this doesn't want to work, I have one more turntable that's an old plastic piece of crap. 
we can try it out see if that works too uh, but we'll do, we'll do something um, problem with cd4 is they specify that you have to have a premium top no notch cartridge that can pick up this 30 kilohertz uh, warble tone and i don't know if this record box thing here is up for it uh, i don't even know what the specs are on this thing but for 15 bucks i don't have high hopes so let me put that cartridge on and then we'll try it again this is an official bum cartridge can you see that as you can see that lettering okay so i got the new cartridge installed um took me a while to figure that one out i haven't put a cartridge on in decades okay so let's try this one more time turn it on see if it can get any squeaks or rumbles out of this thing we got problems with the belt drive how do you cue this thing over that's As far as I know, this thing might not even work. Manually slide it over? Okay, let's take this dust cap off. Slide this over. I don't know how to do this. I'm just winging it here. And that's how far down it goes. Let's add some more weight to this. This turntable looks like it needs a lot of work. Will it touch? No, it's going to hover about three millimeters off the record. What is going on here? hear crunchy noises as it rotates. I think the belts are done. Try a little bit more. Giving it max weight. See if this thing will do anything. One thing about this uh, cartridge and stylus that I bought off of uh, AliExpress, the stylus looks like it's bent to one side. That was brand new out of the box. So yeah, you get what you pay for, I guess. Nope, this ain't going to work. It ain't going to go down far enough. Um, I don't know if there's an adjustment I'm missing here. It seems to go to one side too, like maybe something's bent. Because when I raise it, it, it doesn't come up in the center. It kind of drifts to the right. See that? So this is going to be a repair in itself, this video, this uh, turntable, but let's get see what we can do here. What is going on back here? Let's shut this off. Where's the switch? Okay, I'm going to shut this off. We're going to have a look at this. Okay, so I don't know. This thing is not working. Um, I got it set to zero grams here, and then I moved this counterweight fully forward to reduce the uh, back weight and this stylus this tone arm is hitting a stop and it won't go down any farther than that so i'm not going to force it i'm just going to take this assembly apart or away and i'm going to get another turntable try it out with something else okay so this is my last ditch, ditch attempt here this is i got a dusty old nyco it's a plastic base on it it's not a very high quality yeah look at it's falling apart already Take this off these hinges. At least it's not busted. Put this aside. So I don't know if this thing works or not. Well, that's already not looking very promising. Uh, this thing looks cheap. Anyways, let's plug it in and try it out. This is a Nyko model number NP. 550 Mark II. So let's try this out. I'll hook it up and we'll see if it works. Okay, so I turned it on and it, the belt made a 
crunchy noise as it gets peeled away from the platter. So it is working, I think. I don't know. Speed 45. Let's just see if we can get anything out of this. It does have a stylus. Hey. So this is a bunch of wild field flowers. Come on, lead in. Okay, we got no weight on this tone arm. Let's adjust this. Let's give it some weight. I don't know how you do this. This thing looks janky, boy. I don't know. It doesn't move in. Is it broken? Force it? Huh. Maybe it's backwards. That can't be right. It's counterweight. Doesn't have any threads. Goes this way. And that's as far as it goes. As far as I can push it. to do the old penny trick on the head shell. Yeah, I don't know if this is going to be very good. All right, let's feed it the test record and see if we get anything out of this thing. Yeah, I don't know how this is going to work in super macro mode, but I don't know, you can see that stylus. It's all just caked with junk. And I uh, tried wiping it off. I don't know if this stuff stuck to it. I might have to give it a good clean with some alcohol. It might have some sticky stuff on it. But it looks like... See all the fuzz on it? Okay, I'm going to give this a clean. Alright, take two. Got the stylus cleaned. Looks a lot better. This record is for adjustment of CD4 demodulators. This is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. This is the CD4 adjustment tone. At least we got a solid carrier. It's just distortions down now. adjustment tone. Adjust your control so the four speakers are of equal loudness. Going to the meter here, it looks pretty equal now. The following 
sounds are for channel identification. If all connections and adjustments have been made correctly, the chimes will be heard from each speaker in the order left front, left back, right back, and right front. Okay, that's proper. That's proper. I don't have speakers though. That's proper. And that's coming through. It seems. Let me try that again. The following sounds are for channel identification. If all connections and adjustments have been made correctly, the chimes will be heard from each speaker in the order left front, left back, right back, and right front. You know what? Let's get some speakers here so I can actually experience the sound. So I got a second pair of speakers hooked up, and I think I'm starting to make some progress here. I tried it out. I played the record. Um, the left channel's working pretty good. I got a lot of front rear separation in the front, in the, in the left. Sorry, right channel, not so much. So let's go through this and I'll show you what I'm finding. Um, okay, let's play this. It's gonna be uh, repetitive and boring, I know, and uh, we're just gonna have to deal with it, push through. So let's listen to this again. You can see the CD4 carrier is in for place. Adjustment of CD4 demodulators. Now this tone here this coming up is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. Is only heard if you have it in CD4 mode. If I switch it off. Okay, but you can see the left channel is doing not too bad. It's cutting in and out, but the right channel is completely lost and it's in distortion. So we need to work on that. And that falls in line with what I, when I played the last track and they played the chimes, um, the left channel, I was getting good separation. I could hear the front, I could hear the rear. Um, on the right channel, not so much. It was pretty, pretty much struggling. So let's do this one more time. What I'm gonna do is play this first tone again. That tone is only audible when I have it switched to CD, uh, CD4. When I switch it to Real Matrix or SQ or two channel, that tone disappears. So that is a tone that is demodulated by the demodulator and uh, only appears then. So let's see if we can do this. First, I'm gonna adjust the carrier level and then I'm going to try uh, and see how that works. So let's cue this up. I'm going to use a scope for this record is for adjustment of CD4 demodulators. Now I'm getting weird feed through. This is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. So you can see I had a lot of trouble getting that to lock in, but I think I know what's going on here. I think these two trim pots, VR10 and VR1, are responsible for that. So I'm gonna tweak VR1, which is for the right channel. And that is positioned where right here, you can't probably can't see it on the camera, but uh, let's try this again. This is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. No. No, I didn't get that right that time. This is the CD4 adjustment tone.
Okay, I'm gonna leave it right there. This is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. For some reason we're losing our signal now. I have to readjust the level. This is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. Okay, I think that's correct there, so let's try this again. Seems like the left channel is getting a little stronger signal. Maybe it's my stylus, I don't know. But um, I'm just going to keep tweaking back and forth. It seems like the right channel is having a lot of troubles here, so we're just going to keep going. This record is for adjustment of CD4 demodulators. This is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. carrier level adjustment tone. Okay, it seems like I'm getting it. Try this it one more time. The, this record is for adjustment of CD4 demodulators. I'm going to go off the left channel this time. See if I can tweak the this left channel. Is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. carrier level adjustment tone. Seems like I got the left channel locked in. Let's try and get the right channel better. This is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. adjustment of CD4 demodulators. This is the 30 kilohertz carrier level adjustment tone. carrier level adjustment tone. This is the C 
CD4 adjustment tone. This is the 30 kHz carrier level adjustment tone. So these two potentiometers are adjusting, um, it seems like a cross zero point where you get distortion on both sides and then when you tweak it in the center, you'll get your clean signal. Um, so trying to get these two right, this VR8 and VR3, these are level controls for your left and right. Um, tweak these for getting a balance on uh, your left and right channels. But I'm still working on VR1 and VR2, trying to get it to come. I think my problem is this cartridge, the stylus on it, um, the right channel has a weaker signal coming in. It's slightly weaker. And I can hear as the album rotates, the signal drops in and out. So it's got something to do with the pickup of the signal off the, L uh, the LP or the, the 45. Let's try the other side. I don't think I expected to see much better, but it's supposed to be recorded the same. So let's try this. But I think I am making progress here. So it's just a matter of taking the time to redo it over and over again and tweaking the, uh, the circuits. Now, apparently this is supposed to be identical to the other side of the album. The following sounds are for channel identification. If all connections and adjustments have been made correctly, the chimes will be heard from each speaker in the order left front, left back, right back, and right front. Okay, I can hear it in the back and I heard it in the front. Let's try the right. I can hear it in the back, but it's distorted. I can hear it in the front, it's distorted. Let me try that one more time. Okay, I'm getting from the left front. Getting, I can hear it from the left rear. Left rear, a little quiet and distorted. Right front, I heard that. It was a little bit quiet and distorted as well. Now I have my CD4 separation knobs here, the left and the right, set to about 60%. 60 70 percent that seems where I get the best separation and the best audio quality I'm still concerned about this right channel though I think it has something to do with my stylus my stylus might be damaged or I don't think it's I don't think it's anything to do with the circuitry I think the circuitry is working it's just not being fed a proper signal um, I don't know what else to say about this it, it is working and it's uh, how well is it working? Well, uh, the separation is not as good as I would hoped to hear, but it is separate. You do have separation, and it's not. It's probably because I'm so used to use listening to digital music now, um, and I get perfect separation from my 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 channels. When we go back to this old technology, the separation is just not all there, um, not according to our newer standards. So we're not used to it. But it is working, and uh, does it work well? No, not really. Um, I'd still like to get my hands on an album that I could play um, music to see how well this works. And I think if I did another test with another cartridge 
another stylus combo, I think I would get better results. So I think that's as far as I'm gonna take this right now. I've tweaked these three controls, the carrier level and the two levels for the right channel. And I think I have those centered and this one correct. And I have the left channel centered and correct as well. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. I think I might actually jack up the, um, the volume uh, adjustment for the right channel because I think it's a little weak. I'll go through that and do that a few more times off camera and we'll get this set up right. Okay, I believe I got it correctly aligned and it seems to be working good. I'm um, getting less dropouts like I was earlier. Um, but again, like I said, a lot of this is dependent on your, your cartridge stylus combination. And, uh, you know, I just tweaked everything up according to this stylus and car cartridge. I'm wondering if I replaced this setup with something else, uh, if it would work any different. I have a feeling it's probably going to be pretty much the same, but um, for right now, I think I've got it. So I'm just going to play the last track one more time, the chimes, and uh, I just want to hear how it sounds. So I'm getting left front right now. Left rear, you can hear it. Right rear is working good now. And left front, sorry, right front. Yeah, they're all working good. Still getting a lot of pops and clicks in the, off the album, but um, what can you do? It's, it's vinyl. So yeah, I think that's all it for the alignment. Um, I kind of went off, off script here. I didn't really follow what they told me to do. Um, but I just went through and tweaked each control for its best performance with according to this album and it seems to be working. Um, what I did is I have the CD4 separation controls set to, this one's set to about 60%, this one's probably 75%. And uh, the balance controls, I've got these two set at Oh, let's see, these are probably about two-thirds of the way up. This one's at max, this one's at probably 80%. And I think I have a channel imbalance here with the volume pot, which is no big deal. You can compensate for it with it with the balance controls. Um, the carrier level control, let's see here, I got one, two, three, four, five. three or four clicks from maximum and that's where that seems to work best and then I tweaked a uh, number of pots here I tweaked let's see if I can twist this you can see it better there's two pots here on the right physio for the right channel and they seem to adjust the centering point of where the signal comes in and get the least distortion so that's what I went with those this third pot here is buried. You can't see it. It is a, it is a, uh, a level pot, and you can somewhat adjust the level balance between the two channels with this. But if you go too high on that, you get um, distortion, and you want to have these peaked at a point where you get the best sine wave. Uh, I didn't touch any of these other ones. I don't know what they do. Uh, I'm just going to leave it alone and not play with it anymore. I think it's working. I'm going to leave it at that. All right, so I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I think uh, I've done everything I can do to this. Um, although, you know what? After all that work, I find out that my dial pointer lamp burned out. And I didn't notice that till just now after I put the cover on. I don't know, I'm just going to give it a rest. I'm going to revisit that. But that's an easy fix. That's I can just take the cover off and the wires are right there. I can just put a new lamp in. But here's... The damage well it's not damage it's just here's the results um, 165 capacitors these yellow ones are problematic i had one that failed in me in the cd4 decoder um, the blue sanyo caps also uh, anytime i see those i pull them out because by now they're garbage the rest of these caps fairly decent quality but they still didn't meet i'd say 90 percent of these caps 
here are um, have have failed either in uh, leakage or high ESR. And then of course the two caps, so 165 plus two, the main filter caps. These ones are not that bad, but I replaced them anyways. Four lamps on the scope output device, uh, the meter. And I replaced all the dial lamps with new bulbs. Yeah, it's it's a nice, cleaned up really nice. Um, it doesn't smell any, any as bad as it used to. Um, I've done a lot of cleaning inside and as well as the outside, of course, but it was uh, quite a journey. I started this September 19th and today's November 1st. So almost, well, five weeks, almost six weeks on my bench. And I did, I did take this off to do one other repair. So uh, yeah, it's been sitting on my bench for a while. I was getting tired of looking at it and I wanted to get it off so I could work on some other stuff. I got people, uh, emailing me they want uh, this done or that done and uh, I'd like to keep some of my clients happy that way so let's move on to some more stuff uh, another note if you wanted to see those three any of those three turntables worked on um, leave a comment in the, down below and uh, we'll see what we can do um, right now I'm not really expressing too much interest in turntables they uh, they're okay but uh, I like I like working on receivers and amplifiers. To tell you the truth, that's my favorite. Turntables, not so much, but I, I will work on them. But if you want to see a repair video on the, one of those three turntables that I had out, uh, let's let me know. Um, other than that, I've got some more stuff coming up. I got um, NAD amplifiers. One of my clients brought me two NAD amplifiers to work on, so I'm getting I already repaired one. And I was quite pleased with that. It turned out really well. And uh, get on the second one for him. Anyways, once again, thanks for watching and joining the channel. And we'll see you on the next one. Take care.